then some words about photon-electron interactions. So why do we care? Well, the, the patient will, is injected with a radioactive tracer, emitting photons all the time, and we want to use those photons to make an image of the patient. So we would like all these photons to leave the body of the patient, but unfortunately they will not do that because they have to travel through the body of the patient and along their trajectory, they will see a huge amount of electrons and there is a, a significant chance that they will interact with at least one of those. And if they interact, the photon changes, it may change its direction, it may change its energy, and it provides different uh, information than the one we wanted to see. And then once in the detector, we want the opposite. We would like to interact the photon with the detector because if it in doesn't interact, we don't see it. So there again, we are very interested in to see how photons interact with material. And for nuclear medicine, there are basically just two important interactions. Uh, and one is the photoelectric effect. And the other one is Compton interaction. Photoelectric effect means that um, the photon hits an electron that is strongly bound to the atom, and all of the energy of the photon is used to get that electron out of the atom, and the remaining energy of the photon is used to give it kinetic energy. So the photon is completely gone. It really absorbed. And we lost it. Compton interaction is an interaction of the electron which, with, uh, an outer, uh, with an electron that is at the, the highest shell, so it, it is very lightly bound. And then um, Compton has computed uh, the interaction of a photon with an electron that is entirely free. And these, these loosely bound electrons are very similar to these free electrons. And then the calculation of Compton is basically billiard effect. So it, 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 this is a, an interaction where um, there is no deformation at all. So you, you only need uh, preservation of energy and momentum to do the calculations. But you need to do relativistic corrections, which makes the calculation a bit more complicated. And in this case, the electron takes part of the energy of the photon, and the rest of the energy of the photon is emitted as another photon with lower energy than the original one. So you could say the photon is deflected, and at the same time, it loses energy, so its wavelength is a bit different, a bit longer. Now, if we look at the energies, then uh, measurements with the gamma camera are like 100 or 200 kilo electron volt around here, and with the PET camera is 500. 511 kilo electrovolt, which is the rest mass of an electron, which is um, about here. And so for those energies, the dominating effect in the light material is Compton interaction. So in the patient, uh, there are mainly atoms uh, with a low Z value, water, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, a lot of carbon and oxygen. So there the dominating effect is uh, Compton interaction. If we have very heavy uh, atoms, like for example, lead or gold or uranium, then the dominating interaction is photoelectric effect. But again, that depends on the energy. If the energy is high enough, then even in pretty heavy materials, the dominating interaction can still be Compton. Then pair production is the opposite of annihilation. So if you have a photon that has more than two times 511 kilo electron volt, it carries enough energy to create two particles with a rest mass of 511 kilo electron volt. So it can uh, turn into a positron and an electron. So this never happens for us, but it happens in radiotherapy where, where they use radiation with that kind of energy and they may be creating uh, uh, positron electron pairs when doing that. Okay, so in detectors, as I said before, we really would like to stop the photon and get its energy. So we want a very good interaction with the material. And that is why detectors are typically very heavy. So gamma cameras, PET cameras, <clears throat> they're heavy because they have a lot of shielding. But they're also heavy because the detector material itself is also pretty heavy for it to work correctly. Here are the two effects uh, yeah, uh, shown in a cartoon. So we have a photon hitting a strongly bound electron and the photon is completely used 
to uh, get the photon out of the electron, to, to, so to, to um, compensate for the binding energy, and the rest is uh, used for kinetic energy of the electron. And that means for us, the photon is gone. We cannot measure it. It is absorbed. For Compton interactions, much more subtle. Suppose that our gamma camera is sitting here, and a photon was traveling in the right direction. So it was going to travel through the, col the collimator. That means that we are interested in seeing that photon. Now the photon hits an electron and is deflected. As a result, we will not measure it. So for us, we lost that photon while we should have measured it. This is, we call it photon attenuation. Suppose that the gamma camera was here. Then the original photon was a photon that we would not want to see because it travels in the wrong direction. But now it hits an electron, is deflected, and goes in the right direction to be seen by the gamma camera. So now this photon is not a signal anymore for us. It's more like a nuisance. And then we call it scatter. So if you talk to nuclear medicine people, they make a separation between attenuation and scatter. But if that interaction happened in human tissue or in water or in phantoms, almost always it's exactly the same effect. It's Compton scatter causing both. Here you see um, the interactions plotted as a function of the energy, and this is for water. So here is the energy in kilo electron volt. Again, this is logarithmic scale in, in both directions. And here the attenuation is expressed in per centimeter, which is the probability. Uh, of interaction per uh, centimeter. So the black curve is a total attenuation. And you see that for uh, low energy, the attenuation is much higher than for higher energies. Again, this is a logarithmic scale. So this is a factor of 100 um, from, from here to there. The black curve is explained by photoelectric effect, which is the red, red curve, which is dominating at very low energies and dominating again by orders of magnitude. The gray curve is Compton scatter, which is here. And you see that the sum of the red and gray curve almost completely explain the black curve. However, there is still also Rayleigh scatter. And this is basically a photon interacting with the atom as a whole. So that means like a, a, a billiard ball, which is hitting a, a huge object which cannot be deformed. So if that happens, the, that object will not move at all and the billiard ball will be uh, bounced away and lose no energy at all. So it, it will be knocked away with the same speed. And for the photon, a similar thing happens. It interacts with the entire electron and basically no energy is transferred. So it is deflected, but it continues its trajectory with the same energy that it had originally. So these, these are very nasty. There is no way to see that they have interacted, but they don't travel along the line that we intend. Fortunately, in nuclear medicine, we can ignore them. But you can, for example, not ignore them if you do micro CT, because then, then these uh, low energies are more important. And then here is pair production, but it only starts if you have enough energy to create two particles with 511 kilo, kilo electron volt of rest mass. Here more on Compton scatter, and I talk a bit more on it because all our measurements are affected by Compton scatter. So it's good to have a look at that. And this is the calculation of Compton. So again, this was for an entirely free electron. But in practice, the electrons that uh, interact with our photons are uh, typically almost free. So the calculations are pretty accurate for our purpose. And so this expression says how many energy the photon retains or the new deflected photon has compared to the original photon. So E is the energy of the incoming photon. E prime is the energy of the outgoing photon. And this expression says how this energy depends on the deflection angle. So suppose the theta is zero. That means the photon comes in, interacts with the electron, and then continues in the same direction. If we enter that here, then we get one minus one. So the whole thing vanishes. And it, this says that the outgoing energy is the same as the ingoing energy. So basically, there was no interaction. Nothing happened. We get the biggest effect if we put uh, theta equal to 180 degrees. So the photon is uh, bounced back, because then the cos cosine of theta equals minus one. For PET, the expression is easier because 
MEC squared is the rest mass of an electron is equal to 511 kilo electron volt. And for PET, these photons have also 511 kilo electron volt. So these two factors disappear. So for 180 degree deflection, this becomes two. And that means that one third of the energy is left. And here you see that effect also. You see that as the photon has more and more energy, it needs to, uh, it loses more energy or a larger fraction of its energy in an interaction. So you see that this, this uh, ellipse, it's not really an ellipse, is very asymmetrical. So if, the, if, the, if there is no deflection, we have 511 kilo electron volt. If there is maximum uh, deflection, there is only one third of that. One third of that. For technetium, the thing is more spherical and the lighter the photon or the, the less energy the photon will have, the more this will uh, be like a circle and the less energy a photon needs to uh, give to the electron for the same deflection. The, the, the smaller the fraction. So PET cameras and gamma cameras typically have an energy resolution of 10%. So that means that if we reject photons that have lost more than 10%, we still accept all the photons that are seen here. So there are still pretty large deflection angles possible uh, for photons to still be detected. I uh, basically have explained this. Okay, now we can have uh, a closer look at the calculations. And we they are a bit different for single photon, uh, imaging and for PET imaging, which is why uh, I start here with single photon imaging. So suppose we have an object which is attenuating and in there is a point source and we consider photons that were emitted in the right direction to be detected. And the question is how many of the photons that were started traveling in the right direction will actually make it to the detector. So we know that we had NA of these photons that were taking off in the right direction. And then the question is, how many will go here? So in every point, we can check how many we lose. So we compute the change of that number of photons traveling in the right direction. And we see that the amount of photons we, look, we lose at a particular position x, so over a small distance d, dx, equals or is proportional to the number of photons that are still traveling. You need photons to lose some is proportional to the x, of course, and is proportional to uh, the attenuation coefficient of the material. And if that material is not uniform, then that attenuation coefficient may depend on the position, which is why there is an x here. So basically, this is the very same relation that we saw a few slides ago for the radioactivity and the solution is the same again. So we get this exponent. But now, because mu x is not a constant, but depends on position, we get this integral here. So we say that the number of photons that arrives in detector B equals the number of photons that took off in A traveling in the right direction, but it's reduced by the total attenuation along this line. Okay. And that also means that if I would move this point towards the detector, the integral of the attenuation coefficients would be less. I would have to integrate only from here to here. So we would lose less photons, which is obvious because if I would put the point here, all the photons would make it to the detector. So we see that in spec, it depends on where the photons are emitted to see, to, 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 to know how many actually will make it to the detector. Now we have a look at PET in a PET measurement is only detected if both photons arrive because we use coincidence. We check if the two photons arrive at the same time. And if they do, then we assume that they belong to the same event. So we do the same as before. We put the point source here. Now we emit, emit two photons, one to detector B and one to detector C. So we compute the probability that this photon will make it to detector B. It's exactly the same as before, except that this mu now is a bit different because that photon has a different energy but that we absorb in this mu x. And the same is the case for photon C, for the photons going to C. So we have now um, that the 
total coincidence, as we see, is proportional to the number of photons, the number of photon pairs, times the probability that one photon arrives, times the probability that the other photon arrives. This assumes if we multiply the probability that is only legal if we uh, assume that these events are independent. So that means if one photon interacts with an electron, the other photon shouldn't care. Technically speaking, that is not correct because these photons have emerged from the same event. They have um, orthogonal polarization. And so they should actually be described by the same single uh, wave function. And the chances of one to scatter are not entirely independent from those of the other one. So these particles are entangled. But some physicists have checked it and this entanglement effect is very, very small. So if we just assume that they're independent, we get almost the same results as if we assume they're not independent. So if we make scatter simulations for PET, there is agreement currently that you can ignore this entanglement because it changes the results very little. So if you believe all that, then you will note, of course, that the integral from C to A and from A to B nicely fit together and become an integral from C to B from C to B. So that means if I move the point source from left to right, the number of photon pairs I get remains the same. If so, I, if I move it towards detector B, this detector will see more photons, but this one will see less. And the chances of seeing both photons would stay exactly the same. So that's an interesting effect. So it, it is a disadvantage in a way because the measurement is always effect, affected by the total amount of attenuation along the line and in SPECT that's not true. So that means SPECT may be disturbed less by attenuation than PET, but it depends on where the photons start. On the other hand, it's very convenient that all the measurements that a single detector pair sees are all affected by the same attenuation. So correcting for that attenuation is simple. We take the measurement and we multiply it with the correction factor. That's not true in SPECT. The measurement seen by detector B cannot simply be corrected with a factor because every photon has seen a different attenuation, which makes attenuation correction in SPECT pretty complicated. And uh, people have been looking decades for an analytical solution and only uh, a few years ago that solution was actually found. With that, uh, here you see the effect of that. So this is a typical bone scan where the, the patient is on the bed and either the gamma camera scans along the patient or the patient is scanned through the gamma camera and then two images are acquired. So which image is the image taken by the front detector? Is it the left one or the right one? I think it's the right one, Johan. Yeah, but you've seen yeah. it before, right? You're cheating. So if you wouldn't have seen it, yeah, you, you see detail here that is closer to the front of the patient and by attenuation uh, that is hidden here and the other way around. Which is the reason why those two uh, gamma cameras are used simultaneously, because that provides DMD some depth information. If a spot is more visible in the front image than in the back image, it's more to the front of the patient than in the back of the patient. So, and, and then second, because this is a bone scan, it's, it's pretty sparse. And so that gives the MD enough uh, 3D information, in many cases at least, to uh, analyze this image. Although often they will go for SPECT after all. 